Man has lived under the Costa Rican sun for the last 10,000 years. Up until the 16th century, three tribes of different origins shared the territory. In 1502, Christopher Columbus and his conquistadors were forced ashore to seek refuge from a storm, discovering the country and claiming it as a Spanish colony. 1838, independence. In addition to years of fighting the conquistadors, the internal turmoil led to a civil war before Costa Rica could finally become a true democracy. In Latin America, Costa Ricans are nicknamed Ticos and Ticas, an endearing diminutive based on their everyday speech, which ends often in Ico or Ica. Nature is Costa Rica's primary asset. Unable to escape the devastating effects of deforestation, especially after the price of unrefined wood was reappraised, one-third of the country is now a nature preserve. Another asset? Wildlife. Thousands of species thrive within the protective environment of well-run national parks. As a result, a new and most beneficial resource, tourism. The discovery of nature being of primary interest. Los Brillanticos te invita! In the heart of the Central Valley, at an altitude of about 1,200 meters, San Jose, the capital city, has a layout similar to that of North American cities with its wide avenues and numbered street signs. San Jose is a young and vibrant city founded in the middle of the 18th century. The undefined style of the circular gazebo in the Central Park is quite a contrast to the nearby cathedral built at the end of the 19th century. At some point during the day, the majority of San Jose's 300,000 citizens will stroll along Central Avenue, which leads to the true historical center of the city and the Plaza de la Cultura. National pride is written in all its glory in the Renaissance architecture of the National Theater, which was inaugurated in 1897. The elaborate gilt and marble decor accompany a famous fresco of a picturesque scene depicting the coffee trade. Surrounding the square, Tall metallic tubes indicate the entrance to the Gold Museum, which belongs, and it is no coincidence, to the Central Bank. Here lies a valuable treasure, one of the richest collections of pre-Columbian jewelry, the finery of kings and ruling warriors, or simple decorative objects. These precious ornaments were in part responsible for the terrible massacres perpetrated by the conquistadors. All that shines is not gold. This unusual metal building made with materials imported from France now houses a school and overlooks the bandstand in the historic Morazan Park. The National Museum, which was the old Bella Vista Fortress, acts as another witness to history and still shows signs of the battle fought during the Civil War in 1948. In the garden, these giant stone spheres, some weighing more than 15 tons and discovered in the Osa Peninsula, are an enigma from pre-Columbian times. Their origin still remains a mystery. The Amon neighborhood is the oldest in the city. There is no predominant style to the architecture, they were built when the city experienced a period of rapid expansion during the 19th century. It was during this time that the Europeans began to consume coffee on a regular basis. As a significant producer of this precious bean, Costa Rica, and particularly the capital city, attracted merchants from all over the old continent and beyond. Today, many of the colonial houses that withstood the various earthquakes have become residences for embassies and official organizations. The San Jose Central Market has the best choice in all Costa Rica. Its narrow aisles exhibit an ample display of products from the four corners of the country, including a wide variety of medicinal plants. Even if commerce reigns at the market, Christ stands by to give blessings. Hi, <laughs> 
pipa bien fría. Ay, mami, ay, mami, ay, mami. Y yo te quiero y yo te adoro. Ay, tú me gustas, tú eres mi todo. The streets of San Jose are lively all day. When evening comes, entertainment continues in the bars and hotel casinos. The Josefinos, the people of San Jose, come to play cards hoping to leave with a pocket full of colones, the local currency. Small groups of musicians, bandas, perform in bars and restaurants, bringing a special warmth to the ambiance of San Jose's nightlife. Away from the capital, we cross a region of fertile valleys, the Central Valley, the economic heart of Costa Rica. 60% of the population benefit from the wealth of this area that runs 60 kilometers in length by 20 in width. Cradling the country, the valley welcomed the conquistadors who established Cartago as its first capital city. During the 19th century, San Jose replaced it as the nation's capital. However, Cartago did keep its place as the religious center of the country. The heart of the city provides evidence of this with its numerous churches. The Byzantine-style basilica, Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles, is of special interest. This beautifully crafted wooden structure harbors La Negrita, Our Lady of the Angels. Legend has it she was discovered at this location by a young woman who took her to her village church. Mysteriously, La Negrita returned to where she had been originally found. Several miracle healings have been credited to her, inspiring important pilgrimages. The mountains that surround the Central Valley are situated at the intersection of Costa Rica's two main mountain ranges, the Central Cordillera in the north and the Talamanca Cordillera in the south. The strange atmosphere, emphasized by the mist that sometimes envelops the mountains, is partly due to their volcanic beginnings. Mount Irasu is one of the most spectacular volcanoes in the country. It is 3,432 meters high, and its Amerindian-based name signifies Shaking and Thundering Mountain. Accurately named, since the calm green sulfurous waters filling the crater are deceiving. On March 19, 1963, the eruption was so violent that Cartago and even San Jose, 30 kilometers away, were covered by a thick coat of ashes. The volcano was so active during the following two years Inhabitants of both cities had to use umbrellas to protect themselves from the ashes on windy days. Even if calm has been restored to Irasu, the monster that smolders under the clouds could rise up at any moment. Nevertheless, the volcanic earth provides a generous and favorable environment for cultivating the Central Valley. In addition, the climate is such that several plantations have developed effortlessly. In the Turialba region, crops such as the macadamia nut are found in abundance. Originally from Australia, it is often referred to as the nut of Queensland. The macadamia, which resembles the hazelnut, is shelled and often destined as a flavoring for ice cream once it is exported to North America, where it is most appreciated.
In the modest Turrialba market, we can find a wide variety of agricultural products from the region. Fruits and vegetables from the Central Valley are considered the best in the country. About 20 kilometers from San Jose and sheltered among the countless hills that punctuate the Central Valley, one of Costa Rica's richest crops is grown, coffee. Disappearing into the distance, the coffee plantations cover 90,000 hectares of land in the northern part of the valley. There are over 33,000 farms in the country that are totally devoted to growing the almighty coffee, which is harvested between November and January. Of the 78,000 tons of coffee produced per year, 90% is for exportation. The harvest takes place between November and January. The agriculture of coffee has been strongly developed in Costa Rica since the beginning of the 20th century with the importation of coffee beans from the Caribbean and Guatemala by the French. Coffee is the second most important export of the country and competes for first place with the banana. Coffee produced in Costa Rica has a very high standard. The bean matures later due to the altitude and this makes for a higher quality coffee. Costa Ricans are proud to produce the best coffee in the world. Alajuela, the coffee capital, is notorious for its cathedral dominated by an imposing cupola of corrugated iron. The national park surrounding the Paos volcano is just north of Alahuela. Reaching a height of 2,700 meters, it is the most accessible of the Costa Rican volcanoes and is made up of two craters. The great eruption of January 25, 1910, resulted in a powerful geyser of lava and gas shooting 4,000 meters into the air, the falling ash landing as far away as the Pacific coast. Since then, Paos has been intermittently active and the park is closed on a regular basis in case this monster should suddenly come back to life. East of San Jose, we enter the area of the country known as the rainforest. Today, the forest covers 25% of the country. Established in 1978, the Braulio Carrillo National Park, named after a former president of the Republic, protects 46,000 hectares rising in tiers up to 2,800 meters over rolling mountains. Scientists have registered five different ecological zones where more than 6,000 species of plant life can be found. The exuberant vegetation extending from the humid tropical forest at the lower altitudes all the way to the rainforest in the higher altitudes is caused by an abundant precipitation that may reach 4.5 meters per year. The vast woodlands of the Braulio Carrillo Park are primarily virgin and are difficult to reach. The best way to really see firsthand the rich flora is to take a chairlift. This is the way for getting to the heart of nature, allowing you to glide through the treetops and be bewitched by the power of adventure with nature at its most pristine state. On the Atlantic to the east, the Caribbean coast stretches out for 190 kilometers. The coastline is protected by a tropical forest of varying density that drops off from the mountains towards the flowing streams.
The numerous rivers that flow through the whole of Costa Rica seem to come together in one of the most humid zones of Central America, Tortuguero National Park. Close to the border with Nicaragua at the northern extreme of the country, the park is made up of an extensive network of canals, over 19,000 hectares. Tortuguero means turtle hunter. The park is a famous nesting ground for the leatherback and the green turtle species. In this wildlife preserve where hunting and fishing are strictly prohibited, housing is rare. One village and a few hamlets provide homes for the inhabitants of the park who make their living essentially from tourism. Actually, in the last 15 years, some lodgings have been built in the middle of this humid tropical forest, and the natives now offer their services as guides and forest rangers. During the early morning hours, while the mist hovers over the entire park, is when one really discovers how truly lush Tortuguero is. The rivers literally disappear under the invading foliage, which camouflages a unique species of flora, the guaria, now one of the country's national emblems. And when the incredible fauna of the park wakes up, giant grasshoppers and other insects can be counted by the millions. More than 30,000 green turtles frolic in the marshlands. The narrow canals lead the way to the very center of the rich vegetation. It is there that one encounters the most hostile inhabitants of the forest, the caimans, one of a hundred species of reptiles found in the park. Iguanas, jacanas, and white-faced monkeys, scarcely visible under the thick layers of leaves, find protection and food. Kingfishers, tiger herons, as well as 300 other species of birds have been registered at Tortuguero. The butterflies, with their infinite diversity, are even more numerous and continue to attract researchers from all over the world. 15,000 different varieties have been catalogued and many have still to be identified. There are also countless snakes. Some are harmless, but occasionally beauty equals danger. Peaceful buffalo toads and leopard frogs are commonly known. The one to watch out for is the tiny 2.5 centimeter vermilion colored dart frog. This impressive tropical Venice, the Tortuguero National Park, owes its survival to the ecologists who raised government consciousness by addressing vital issues pertaining to the park. The decision to make this park a wildlife preserve in 1975 was received with great displeasure by the banana promoters and producers. A large section of the interior on the Caribbean side of the country is dedicated to growing one of the most important resources of Costa Rica, the banana. Unlike coffee, which sustains a large number of independent producers, the cultivation of banana is regulated by a North American quasi-monopoly. Since the end of the 19th century, the banana production employs tens of thousands of workers who harvest, clean, and prepare several million tons of the famous fruit every year. Even with the help of mechanization, being employed at a banana plantation is hard work, and one looks forward to a well-deserved break. Meanwhile, Costa Rican bananas are exported around the world.
Puerto Limón is the largest port in the country and a departure point for coffee and banana exportation. This industry set the stage for development of a city that, while keeping its Spanish traditions, has been transformed by the arrival of a foreign workforce. The first wave of immigration was principally African-American and Jamaican, and they now make up 25% of the population in the region. The Asian population was originally recruited to build a railroad between Puerto Limón and San Jose. They quickly integrated with the local commerce. Even though Puerto Limón hasn't escaped modern times, it has kept its provincial charm. It is known for the municipal park Vargas, where one can find a great variety of trees, like the ceiba, the god tree of Central America. The beautiful foliage provides just enough shade for a quick nap. Trees are an integral part of the port town's history. Limon, the lemon tree, is indicated in the second part of its name and was the only one found in the area. Its leaves served to make an infusion that helped alleviate the symptoms of yellow fever during an epidemic, saving much of the population from certain death. The Atlantic coastline of Costa Rica has alternating white and black sandy beaches. In 1502, on his fourth voyage to the Americas, Christopher Columbus landed on these shores. He and his crew were well received by the native people, and the conquistadors marveled at the beauty of the region and were impressed by the local chief's dazzling array of ornamental golden jewelry. It was here that Columbus chose to baptize the region Rich Coast or Costa Rica. South of Puerto Limón, villages are few and homes are scattered about with a typical Caribbean simplicity. A large part of the region's wealth is supplied by the ocean. All flora and fauna are preserved here due to the politics of ecology within the framework of the national parks. The famous Cahuita National Park is an example, providing a protected environment for a natural wall of coral in the depths of the sea. The 1,000 hectares of vegetation along the shore are also protected. We can see an assortment of trees, plants, and tropical flowers, some seductive, others intriguing. The peaceful village of Cahuita was founded in 1828 by William Smith, a Caribbean native who arrived by way of Panama on a hunt for turtles. He was so captivated by this welcoming little nook that he relocated his family and settled here. Since then, his descendants have become a part of a racially mixed population, as is the case for the rest of the Atlantic region. However, it seems that the influence of the Caribbean has forever marked the area, despite the contribution from other cultures. The fusion becomes clear at night when the music and the party begins.
The south of Costa Rica is a mountainous region that runs along the Panama border. This is the traditional land of the Amerindians. Not far from the Atlantic coast, the village of Bribri marks the entrance to the most important of the 22 Indian reservations in Costa Rica, Talamanca. The Amerindians, who make up only 1% of the Costa Rican population, settle in this area of Central America more than 10,000 years ago. Even though most of them have adopted the lifestyle of their fellow citizens, they are proudly protective of their territory, one of the most beautiful in the whole country. At the crossroads of several civilizations, the Costa Rican Amerindians in Central America have a unique character. There is an Amerindian population of about 400,000 individuals spread around the territories of Costa Rica. The majority live in the south of the country in a zone between the Atlantic and Pacific coasts near the Talamanca mountain ranges. They all have the same linguistic base, the Macro Chicha, the name given to the indigenous groups inhabiting the Atlantic coast of Central America and Colombia. We also find Amerindians in the north, in the Guanacaste region, who are the descendants of the Maya and Aztec people. The origin of those in the south can be traced to tribes in Panama, Colombia, and Venezuela. The Amerindians in Costa Rica lived an unusual experience during colonial times. Destroyed by disease, they were the only native people on the continent who vehemently resisted slavery. This cultural exception could explain the Costa Ricans' determination to live in democracy. Classified as a world's biosphere reserve, the vast Talamanca range travels from the center of Panama to the outskirts of San Jose. Two enormous national parks, Chiripo and Amistad, friendship, protect a vast area that makes up 12% of Costa Rica's land. The Cerro de la Muerte, mountain of death, stands 3,400 meters in height. The mountains are the nesting grounds for many species of birds, like the hummingbird. Their technique is to fly at extremely high speeds, staying in one spot or moving backwards as they flit about, consuming the flower's nectar. Another even rarer phenomenon hidden in the forest, attracting passionate interest from the four corners of the planet, The Quetzal. This is one of the most beautiful and secretive birds in the world. Using the branches of the enormous trees as a cloak, it conceals itself on the mountain of death. There are many Quetzal here because the environment is perfect. This is a primary forest that provides the Quetzal with its essential diet, abacaros. And it would die if it were to be taken away from here. The history of the Maya and Aztec civilizations is the motivation for seeking out the Quetzal. The bird represents the god of fertility during the pre-Columbian ages. That is why we watch the Quetzal, as he belongs completely to our history.
The government, who recognized the need to cultivate the fertile land, invited the Italians, encouraging them to come and work the land. In this way, the village of San Vito was founded by Italian immigrants in 1950. It rests at an altitude of 1,000 meters and now has a population of 10,000. San Vito is recognized throughout the country as having the most important conservatory of flora in the country, the Wilson Botanical Gardens. Established in 1963, it was set up for the study and preservation of more than 1,000 vegetable species. The layout of the garden is simple. The gardens cover an area of 265 hectares, and 10 hectares of this is to research numerous plants and flowers. The remainder is basically primary forest and some secondary forests. There is another small section that is in a reforestation phase for observation of the early development of various species. We work with several researchers who study plants indigenous to Central America, as well as the evolution of plants from all over the world. The waves of the Pacific break along the Costa Rican coast for more than a thousand kilometers. The seaside resorts and beautiful natural parks make it one of the most seductive areas of the country. At the base of a small gulf, Golfito, the seaside port, flourished during the 1940s as a result of banana exportation. Today, the town benefits from its status as a duty-free zone. The traditional houses reflect the vitality of its colorful past. The streams that empty into the Pacific Ocean do not disturb the enthusiastic surfers. In Dominical, what counts is the capriciousness of the wind and the size of breakers, which could make you lose your head. Surfers come from all over the world to defy the laws of gravity and to challenge the power of the waves. A complete body massage, a long siesta beside the pool, and you're refreshed and ready for something new. One of the highlights, horseback riding, so you can explore the interior and discover firsthand the beauty of the region. Water, essential to the Costa Rican way of life, provides an exceptional environment for the flora and fauna. It is synonymous with leisure, relaxing or rigorous. The same water paves the way for countless crops, even the most water demanding, rice. Last but not least, it dictates the conditions of the roads, which during the rainy seasons of November and May might cause an unexpected delay. The only way to get around the road conditions is to take a plane. The widespread fields of palm oil trees next to dense woodlands act as a backdrop for a long winding coast with miles and miles of white sandy beaches. Following the shore towards the north, we arrive at one of the most popular seaside resorts in Costa Rica, Quepos. Once a banana port, today Quepos thrives on fishing and is known to tourists as the gateway to the Manuel Antonio National Park. The outline of the park is etched with superb beaches and contains a very dense primary forest. 
It is not only the quality of the beaches that makes the park so popular, but that one rubs shoulders with prehistoric animals like the iguana. Of a rather social nature, they enjoy basking in the sun and even taking a dip in the sea. There are more than 700 species in the world that belong to the iguana family. They are herbivores and polygamous. Each male lives with four females in a well-defined territory. Although sometimes he has to share his territory with a certain familiar two-legged species. Further north, the best way to cross from Punta Arenas to the Nicoya Peninsula is to take a ferry. The Pacific coast that borders 200 kilometers of the peninsula and the northern part of the country all the way to the border with Nicaragua is an endless chain of beaches with idiosyncratic names such as Flamingo Beach, Sugar Beach and Coconut Beach the most renowned being Tamarindo Beach. Besides sailing, the beach is a famous haven for surfers in search of adventure. The entire southern part of the Nicoya Peninsula has experienced a very rapid growth since the 1980s. Investors have been building villas and homes by the hundreds, integrating them into the majestic surroundings. Small resorts have sprung up all over the area, and the marinas are favorite vacation spots for foreign visitors. Tourism has rapidly become a major source of revenue for Costa Rica, and the country is equipped with the necessary infrastructures to develop the industry. Even though it is a pioneer in the field of ecotourism, Costa Rica is determined to draw attention to all its attributes. In the province of Guanacosta to the northwest, the influx of tourism has had very little impact on the inhabitants, who devote themselves almost entirely to fishing. The indigenous origins of a large majority of the population have turned Guanacasta into one of the pillars in the fight for democracy in Costa Rica. Despite their isolation from the political center in San Jose, the people of this province bravely resisted William Walker's troops during the mid-1850s. The great dream of this American adventurer was to conquer and rule Central America. A hundred years later, they opposed Somoza, the dictator of their Nicaraguan neighbor, and his desire for conquest. Today, the key word in Guanacosta is peace, adapting to the tourist invasion while holding on to their tradition, their culture, and the rhythm of the southern African instrument, the marimba. The northern part of the Guanacaste province is a vast green area that encompasses more of the country's beautiful national parks. Hidden within the region are several other points of interest.
Liberia, referred to as the White City, has 40,000 inhabitants and is built around a park at the city center. It has been the capital city of the province since its beginning two centuries ago. Liberia is one of the few townships in Costa Rica that has protected its pretty colonial houses by restoring them regularly with great care. The old woman's mountain, Mount Uricon de la Veja, another volcano, is about 25 kilometers from Liberia and spreads over 14,000 hectares of parkland with the same name. Extremely well kept, the park is home to numerous mammals like the coati, a sort of raccoon, as well as several hundred species of butterfly. There are many ways to discover the park depending on where your heart leads you. The first is the most classic and relaxing, on horseback. The next requires equipment that might appear more sophisticated, but will prove indispensable. One must cross several hundred meters of the park to get to the center of the action, Canopy Tour. Here the thrill comes from throwing oneself into the void. The Canopy Tour, as its name implies, is a way to get to know, in a most spectacular manner, the forest roof just under the tallest trees. Excitement guaranteed. It's very fast. The adrenaline is really strong. In Costa Rica's 30 parks, the fauna is actively protected. Outside these reserves, animal life is in constant danger, particularly at the hands of deforestation. A number of refuges have been set up not far from the forest for the protection of the animal kingdom. Most of them are open to visitors. The most recognized is that of Mrs. Hagnauer, which has been operating since 1950. Today, this retired agronomist raises wildcats, wild felines like the puma, also known as cougars, the playful ocelots, and jaguars. The jaguar, threatened by extinction, is the most dangerous but also the most beautiful of the animals in Costa Rica. Arenal Lake, 30 kilometers long and 5 kilometers wide, is one of the jewels of Costa Rican geography. Winds of up to 80 kilometers per hour sweep across the lake from December to March, blowing on the gigantic windmills that supply the nearby villages with electricity. A privileged spot for hikers, Lake Arenal is a private kingdom for some charming animals such as the coati or the howler monkey, whose cry one can hear kilometers away. The multitude of streams that pour into Lake Arenal are excellent for whitewater rafting. Another site to explore, the many caves that have been carved out around the lake. 
Penetrating into the bowels of the earth is always a thrill, but synonymous with extreme danger, more so on the edge of the Arenal volcano that hovers over the lake from a height of 1,600 meters. After being inactive for almost 3,000 years, it suddenly came back to life on July 29, 1968, causing substantial destruction and death. Since then, at night, the volcano provides a spectacular show of glowing lava that is at the same time fascinating and disturbing. The Monte Verde Natural Reserve offers an original way to explore the rainforest. The Skywalk, Walk Through Heaven, is a walk along a series of suspension bridges that hang high above a multitude of trees and plant species. The paths that link the different bridges wind their way through an unbelievable labyrinth between fern trees, thick hanging vines, and the thick, rich green foliage. The jungle covers a large part of Costa Rica, life source for the entire planet and synonymous with adventure and legend. The foothills of the Talaran Range lead us back into the vast plains of the Central Valley with several villages to the north of San Jose. They are Sapote, Naranjo and Grecia. The Sarchi Church is the most astonishing found in this area. The brightly colored frescoes are a reminder that Sarchi is recognized for its beautifully decorated carretas, or coffee carts. The wooden carts almost disappeared with the arrival of tractors in the 1950s. During that time, certain craftsmen began to systematically paint them until they evolved into little works of art. We have carried on with this tradition for the last hundred years. In fact, this art is based on a combination of indigenous art and art brought over by the first Spanish settlers. In Costa Rica, for many years, these carts were the only means of transporting coffee. One day, the peasants decided to paint them, simply to make them look beautiful. Beauty and simplicity, two words that accurately describe Costa Rica. And one might add a third, purity. Here, respect for nature in its untamed state sets a precedent. Even if it is sensitive to the call of progress, Costa Rica evolves following its own tune, natural and harmonious. <laughs>